Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. For the Sundays in Lent, the next few Sundays, we're going to be working through the Psalms that have been appointed. The Psalms, the prayer book of the Bible, these wonderful verses that were sung and and choreographed and talked about how the church was was working and how God was coming to them. So today our our psalm is Psalm 25, uh, verses 1 through 10, which I will read now. And then afterwards, our choir will have um, an accompanist um, after the sermon. So, Psalm 25. To you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. O my God, in you I trust. Let me not be put to shame. Let not my enemies exalt over me. Indeed, none who wait for you shall be put to shame. They shall be ashamed who are wantonly treacherous. Make me to know your ways, O Lord. Teach me your paths. Lead me in your truth and teach me, for you are the God of my salvation. For you I wait all the day long. Remember your mercy, O Lord, and your steadfast love, for they have been from of old. Remember not the sins of my youth or my transgressions. According to your steadfast love, remember me for the sake of your goodness, O Lord. Good and upright is the Lord. Therefore, he instructs sinners in the way. He leads the humble in what is right and teaches the humble his way. All the paths of the Lord are steadfast love and faithfulness for those who keep his covenant and his testimonies. To be able to blush is a gift from God. The red cheeks of disgrace let us keep a balance in our lives, a compass of what is right and what is wrong. It holds you back, it holds me back. I shudder to think of what I might do if I knew there was no consequences, no punishment, no embarrassment, no hell, no divine eyes staring at me when I did whatever it was that I wanted to do. So to blush... To feel a a shame is a silent testimony that we are all accountable to the deeds that we do. Roman 2 speaks of this. It says, The requirements of the law are written on their hearts. Their consciences also bear witness. And their thoughts sometimes accusing them and at other times even defending them. This law is written on our hearts. We are to know it, to decide what to do, what is right and what is wrong. God has given us his law, his will for his creation, and those that he has created. Too quickly we, we pass over this shame and we say that everything will be okay. We, we don't let people dwell in this sin or what God is speaking through them through this law written on their hearts or in their consciences. Sometimes we can use this for good. As a parent, you rely on this probably more than you even know. You want your child to know what is right and what is wrong. As a child, one time I remember I stole a cookie, a literal cookie from a literal cookie jar, and my mom caught me afterwards, right after I had done it. And so I think it was for a church bake sale or another kind of bake sale. She made a dozen cookies, and so (laughs) she made me Uh, write on a new piece of paper, cross out 12, and I had to write 11 cookies, and I had to stand by by the table the whole time and tell everybody that walked by that I ate one of the cookies. And so if they wanted to buy the cookies, they weren't going to get 12, but they were going to get 11. Shame shame works. (laughs) Uh, It works. You remember it, right? Um, I'll never forget that. I'll never forget that. (laughs) It's Good time, I guess. Um, (laughs) The shame that that we want, I'm I'm talking about, we're talking about shame in a lot of different ways. Ways in which it's used for good, ways in which it can be used for bad, too. Um, But in ways we want it to be good. Ways we want people to remember what is right and what is wrong. Even if it means embarrassing your son. But too often, we don't let people dwell in in this shame or or their discernments of their conscience or what is weighing on top of them. Our first parents were created without the shame. In Genesis 2, it says, And the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. 
But after sinning against God, we know that they hid their nakedness and they were ashamed of their sin before God. Shame is a consequence of our sin. It has us tremble before the Almighty Maker. But there's another type of shame, the, the kind of shame in which our psalmist is speaking of today. He says, let me, let me not be put to shame. Let not my enemies exalt over me. This is the shame of defeat when you lie on your back with the devil's foot planted firmly upon your neck. It is the shame of caving into your lust, to your pettiness, to your hatred, to the anger boiling inside of you. The shame that makes us look back on what has happened and our decisions and we wonder what came over us and what took control. Who was that person that was yelling in traffic? Who was that person that snapped at their family? Who was that person? Couldn't have been me. But time and time again, it is. It's the shame that we all know too well. Jeremiah 2 writes, Although you wash yourself with soda and use an abundance of soap, the stain of your shame is still before me. We have all sinned and been stained and feel shame before God and before others for what we have done. And yet there, there is another type of shame, too. The shame of feeling polluted by the sins of others and, and of our world, too. The shame of the innocent, misused, abused, dirtied, not by their own will and own desires, but those of another. It is the undue shame of the rape victim, the beaten spouse, the molested child, or yes, even the senseless death due to violence. There is shame. And like the smell of cigarette, it clings to you from smokers around you, even when you are not the person who has lit up the cigarette. So this smell of shame clings to the innocent, ever reminding them of how others have breathed upon them the smoke of their sins. It's unavoidable. You can't get it off you. It stays in your clothes. It stays within you, and you feel it in others, and in the world. If guilt is said to give you a heavy heart, then I believe that shame gives you an unclean heart. An unclean heart soiled and smelling of death, crying out for the waters of purification, something, anything to wash away this stench that has been given. And the more we feel the sin of the world, the more we just see it in the news, we see it in others, we see it in our families, we see it in ourselves, the more we need to look within ourselves. To look within ourselves for our need of our personal purification and cleansing. To get rid of our shame. If you remember the story of Job in the Bible, where, where God allows Satan to attack Job, and, and he says that Job will stay faithful despite anything that Satan throws at him. So he takes away, as Luther would say, his goods, his fame, his child, his wife. He takes about anything that is of value to him, his health. And he says that this man will still praise my name. And Job has moments of doubt, but, but he believes that God is still with him and caring and preserving for him. But in the story, Job has three friends, and these th three friends come and they offer counsel and help to him, and they give him different bits of advice, some good, some very bad. And Zophar comes to Job, and he says this, Yet if you devote your heart to him and stretch out your hands to him, talking about to God, if you put away the sin that is in your hand and allow no evil to dwell in your tent, then you will lift up your face without shame. You will stand firm and without fear. You will surely forget your trouble, recalling it only as water has gone by. He goes on and, and talks more about what Job needs to do. To get rid of a shame, he is telling Job, you go do it. You act better. You put away your sin. There is a place and a time to feel shame, to feel the burden of God's law, and there is also a time to rest in the comfort of his freedom that he gives in the gospel. 
Zophar comes and he tells Job to work it out himself. He tells him that he needs to get to work. He needs to act better. He needs to straighten up. Job has repented, and Job knows what he has done. He knows that, that God is still holding him in his hand. Zophar is telling him that he needs to look within himself to become clean, to be purified. That is not the right course. Oftentimes, it is the course that many of us pick to tell and to give advice to others when what they really need is the comfort of the gospel. There is a time for law, and there is a time for gospel. All of us cry aloud with St. Paul, Wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? Not ourselves, not anything within ourselves, but one stronger and mightier than I, who can cleanse us and purify. To him we look. There is someone who takes away your shame. For he has made your shame his own, that he might give you in its place purity and wholeness. This someone, our Lord Jesus Christ, he yearns. He desires, he pursues us to cleanse you of the shame of your own sins and the shame you may feel from the sins of others. And because it is his fervent desire to do for what you cannot do for yourself, he gives you the gift of purity, cleanness, and beauty. This Jesus Christ, though pure and shameless in and of himself, allowed the sewer of your shame to be poured over his head. This Jesus who put all your lust, pettiness, anger, and hatred in a cup, placed it to a lift, and swallowed every last drop. This Jesus who lays down and lets the devil stand firmly upon his neck so that it's not upon ours. This Jesus who is so full of love for you that he let others misuse, abuse, and pollute him, covering his face with the redness of his own blood and the vileness of, his, of people's spit. This Jesus, our shame bearer, did it all on our behalf. The liquid in his blood, the blood that has flowed from his wounds on the cross that we look to this Lent, the blood that flows onto your tongue in the Lord's Supper in a few minutes, the blood that the Spirit sprinkles on your heart, body, soul, and conscience, rendering them holy and pure in the eyes of God. This blood of Christ has made us clean. Blood making us clean kind of a weird thing to say. Maybe if you've grown up in the church your whole life, you're used to language like that, and maybe it just kind of rolls off your shoulder like nothing else. That blood can make us clean. It's not usually what we think. When we see blood, we think that we think of death. We think that something has gone horribly wrong. The other day, uh, yesterday, Courtney and I were, were trimming Jackson's nails. And, and we were doing it, and we were holding him down, and Courtney was doing it. At the last moment, he slipped, and we got the tip of his finger off. Not, not a lot, not a lot. I made that sound worse than it was. Um, it, wasn't too, it wasn't too bad, just a little tip. But there was blood. So as new parents, we started freaking out, and we, and we didn't know what to do. So we were running water, and we were doing it all, working it. But through this all, there was blood on everything on our clothes, on his toys, on this. And, and throughout the day, he would, he would keep playing with it, and he would bang in on something, and he would keep doing it, and it would reopen, and we would get blood again everywhere. And I learned yesterday firsthand, blood is really hard to clean, and it's not very fun. There's nothing cleansing about this blood in the way that we think about it. You gotta take salt water or vinegar or something. You gotta work to get this blood instead of this blood cleansing us. See, but it's only the blood of our almighty Savior that cleanses and forgives and makes us clean. Our blood can do no such thing, but the blood that has flown from the Savior washes over all of us and makes us clean. Not our blood, but his blood. Ephesians 2 says, But now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far away have been brought near through the blood of Christ. By his blood we are brought near to God the Father. We have been washed, we have been sanctified, we have been justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ by the Spirit of our God. Blood has made us clean. 
you are clean in Christ Jesus, my brothers and sisters in Christ. You are clean. Through the waters of your baptism, the forgiveness of sins has been given to you, and you have been washed. The slate of sins that, that no paper amount could ever hold from all of us has been wiped clear, emptied, freed. For the psalmist says, For the paths of the Lord are steadfast love and faithfulness. As a follower of Jesus Christ, you stand underneath a banner which flows above your head that says, You are forgiven. You are free. It is finished by the work of Christ on the cross and the blood that has flown from his sides has made you clean. This banner declares, calls, yells, and tells you who you are and who has saved you. The psalmist ends and he says, none who wait for you shall be put to shame. None of us who wait on the Lord will be put to shame. For those who wait for Christ, find him. Arms wide open with an embrace ready, calling all dirty sinners to himself. Come and let me wash you. Let me make you clean. Stand underneath the blood that has fallen from my side and let me give you what you really desire, a clean bill. Saying that your debt has been paid in full, you are now clean to serve and love others. This is the gospel of Jesus Christ, of which we are not ashamed, for it is the power of God that makes us shame-free in the one who became shame for us. Amen. Let's pray. <clears throat> Lord God, Heavenly Father, we come before you as sinners in need of being washed, of being made clean. Lord, we know that you do not put to shame those who come before you, but you bring us into your arms and you forgive us all of our sins. You wipe clear every record of sins that, that we have and we are given new life. Lord, remember not the sins of our youth or our transgressions, but according to your steadfast love, remember me, remember all of us for the sake of your goodness, O Lord. The paths that you have our steadfast love and faithfulness. It's in you we put our hope. Amen. <clears throat>